1945. It was twice the uh, choice of the Conservative Book Club, and it is a classic in its field. And I highly recommend for those of you that are interested in the topics that we discussed, do you want to see how these ideas have developed in uh, recent years and, and who the personalities are that you hear talked about today, uh, that would be an excellent starting point for you. He is also widely known for his work uh, on the, his books that he's written on the life of Herbert Hoover. He has written a highly detailed three-volume account of Herbert Hoover's life, and he is working on a fourth volume. And he is also the author of a book, Reappraising the Right, The Past and Future of American Consu Con Conservatism. Uh, Dr. Nash was the valedictorian of his graduating class in high school. He went on to graduate summa cum laude in Phi Beta Kappa from Amherst College, and from there he received his PhD in history from Harvard University in 1973. So he is a distinguished scholar, and we are happy to have him with us today. He's going to talk to us about the legacy of our 40th president, and I, 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 I'm excited to hear what he has to say. So help me welcome Dr. George H. Nash. Thank you very much, Dr. Machak, for that gracious introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure as well as an honor to be with you at this Northwood University function. This is the first time I've come to a Freedom Seminar, but it is the second time in less than a year that I've had the privilege of being at a Northwood function. The first time was up at the campus at Midland last October, and the person who invited me was the other Dr. Nash in the room, Dr. Timothy Nash. And I had a wonderful time with the students and the people I met up at Midland. And uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the uh, occasion here with you. And have had the pleasure also of having conversations with a number of you. I've enjoyed that. The title of my talk this afternoon is Ronald Reagan's Vision of America. From the time of the Puritans to the era of Ronald Reagan, a sense of uniqueness has molded America's identity. On board the ship Arabella, as it sailed from New England in 1630, John Winthrop admonished his Puritan brethren, we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. The colonists were about to establish what he called a model of Christian charity. And he warned that if we deal falsely with our God in this work, we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. The Puritans were not the only European migrants who believed that their foray into the North American wilderness had transcendent significance. A century and a half later, it seemed to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia that not only God, but all mankind was watching as the 13 British colonies submitted their case for independence to what they called a candid world. On July 4, 1776, just hours after the Declaration of Independence was approved, the Continental Congress appointed a committee of three men, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams to design an official seal for the new United States of America, a seal that would visually represent this new nation's self-understanding. Franklin suggested an image of Moses lifting up his wand and dividing the Red Sea while Pharaoh was overwhelmed by its waters. Underneath this scene would be written the motto, Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Jefferson proposed a depiction of the children of Israel in the wilderness, led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. 
Although neither of these motifs made its way into the committee's final report, they did reflect the conviction of many of the revolutionary generation that America was in some sense a new Israel, divinely chosen and blessed to live in a promised land. The complicated design of Franklin, Jefferson, and Adams eventually, that they eventually submitted did not impress the Continental Congress. It was not until nearly six years later, after unsuccessful efforts by two more committees, that Congress finally agreed upon its design for its great seal. Consider its symbolism as found today on the back of America's $1 bill. And if any of you have $1 bills, you can look now or later to see what I'm discussing here. One side of the seal features a bald eagle holding arrows and an olive branch in its talons and a banner with the words E Pluribus Unum, meaning one out of many, in its beak. The reverse side is less familiar and more revealing. It shows an unfinished pyramid with the date 1776 engraved in Roman numerals at its base. Below the pyramid is the Latin motto Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages. Above the pyramid is an unblinking eye, the eye of providence, and above it the Latin words Anuit Coeptus, meaning he, God, has favored our undertakings. Adopted by the Continental Congress in 1782, the great seal of the United States encapsulated America's self-image as it embarked upon nationhood. America, the seal suggested, was not just another nation-state. It represented something novel in history. Moreover, it portended the future, a new order of the ages, a decisive break from the past. The old world, with its monarchs and regimes of oppression, was to be left behind forever. Now, in a vast and nearly empty land, there would be constructed by conscious design, under the patronage of providence, a great republic, an experiment in self-government on a continental scale. During the 19th century, belief in America's divinely ordained destiny took even deeper root in the popular mind. In 1830, for instance, the prominent Unitarian clergyman William Ellery Channing wrote, we cannot admit the thought that this country is only to be a repetition of the old world. We delight to believe that God in the fullness of time has brought a new continent to light in order that the human mind should move here with a new freedom, should form new social institutions, should explore new paths, and reap new harvests. In 1850, in his early novel White Jacket, Herman Melville made an even bolder claim. He wrote, Escaped from the house of bondage, Israel of old did not follow after the ways of the Egyptians. To her was given an express dispensation. To her were given new things under the sun. And we Americans are the peculiar chosen people, the Israel of our time. We bear the ark of the liberties of the world. And so it went in the 19th century and well into the 20th. Gradually, alongside the popular proclamations of America's singularity and divine calling, there arose attempts by more detached analysts to plumb the depths of the nation's distinctive character. From Alexis de Tocqueville to Frederick Jackson Turner and a host of others, observers at home and abroad struggled to define just what it was that made America so different, especially from Europe. That America was different, nearly everyone agreed. In time, scholars affixed to these differences the label American exceptionalism, a term we're hearing often today in our political discussions. In recent years, the term American exceptionalism has become entangled in ambiguity. Inside academia, 
Social scientists who invoke the term use it tentatively and descriptively as a tool for the comparative study of cultural differences. Outside academia, a different attitude prevails. There, Americans, especially on the political right, use the expression prescriptively to denote a belief system laden with normative value. To most Americans in 2012, their country is not merely exceptional in some vaguely anthropological sense, but exemplary. It is against this historical and current events backdrop that I turn this afternoon to Ronald Reagan. Of the 43 individuals who have so far served as President of the United States, probably none devoted more rhetorical effort than he did to explaining and extolling America's national purpose. No American statesman ever associated himself so persistently with John Winthrop's providential metaphor borrowed from Jesus of a city upon a hill. In recent decades, no figure on the national stage has rivaled our 40th president as a preacher and expositor of what some have called America's civic religion. Reagan's contribution to the theory and practice of American exceptionalism goes to the heart of our ongoing quest for identity as a people. And it raises a question to which I will return later. In the post-Reagan era, is the creed that he championed still persuasive to his compatriots? But first, let us turn to Reagan. In the summer of 1981, in the opening phase of his presidency, he confessed to one of his biographers, what I'd really like to do is go down in history as the president who made Americans believe in themselves again. But Reagan was far more than an affable psychologist and cheerleader. He understood that if he were to persuade his countrymen again truly to believe in themselves, he must instruct them on who they were and what they could become. A little over four years later, in September 1985, the Reverend Pat Robertson of the Christian Broadcasting Network interviewed Reagan at the White House. Mr. Robertson's first question was, when historians write about the Reagan administration, what do you want them to say? The president replied in part, I guess maybe just that I helped perpetuate this great American dream. A moment later, Reagan admitted that he was optimistic about the future. And at the end of the interview, he explained why. I am convinced, he said, this is a nation under God. And as long as we recognize that, believe that, I think he'll help us. In these two compact phrases, this great American dream and a nation under God, Reagan revealed much about the vision of America that had stirred his soul for most of his adult life. During these years, Reagan had become known as one of the country's most effective orators, and no subject inspired him to greater eloquence than his perception of the meaning of the American experience. More than most of our presidents, Reagan's path to the White House was marked by a series of powerful speeches. And it is in these that we may discern his unfolding understanding of American exceptionalism. Reagan's vision first found extended expression in very nearly the earliest public address by him of which we have a complete record. His commencement address at William Woods College in Fulton, Missouri in June 1952. He entitled his talk, America the Beautiful. In his remarks, Reagan announced his belief that America was, in his words, less of a place than an idea. This idea was the inherent love of freedom in each one of us. The idea, the basis of this country and our religion, the idea of the dignity of man, the idea that deep within the heart of each one of us is something so godlike and precious that no individual or group has a right to impose his or its will upon the people. 
that no group can decide for the people what is good for the people so well as they can decide for themselves. Reagan confided that for some time he had thought of America as a place in the divine scheme of things that was set aside as a promised land, open to anyone in the world with the courage and desire to tear up roots, strive for freedom, and attempt and dare to live in a strange and foreign place. Reagan added that he believed that God had shed his grace on America and had always in this divine scheme of things kept an eye on our land and guided it as a promised land for these people. He closed by affirming in words that consciously or unconsciously echoed Jefferson and Lincoln that, in Reagan's words again, this land of ours is the last best hope of man on earth. One may plausibly say that Ronald Reagan's career as America's history tutor began on that June day before an audience of a few hundred people at a small women's college in Missouri. Five years later, he was again a commencement speaker, this time at his alma mater, Eureka College in Illinois. Once more, he expostulated on his vision of American uniqueness, but with a few important new twists. He informed his listeners that he had never been able to believe that America is just a reward for those of extra courage and resourcefulness who had managed to move to or be born here. No, America, he announced, was a land of destiny with a mission and a responsibility to all mankind. He told the graduating seniors that they must perpetuate their heritage of freedom and hold it literally in trust for that day when we shall have fulfilled our destiny and brought mankind a great and long step from the swamps. In these two commencement addresses at William Woods College in 1952 and at Eureka College in 1957 may be found in embryonic form the principal themes that Reagan would expound for the rest of his life. America to him was a singular society, a land that had attracted immigrants from all over the world to come here and pursue their dreams. More than that, it was a promised land the gift of a benevolent providence who continued to cast his protective eye upon it. Endowed with the blessings of liberty, it also bore a heavy responsibility to a mankind for whom it remained the last best hope. If the now middle-aged Hollywood movie actor, and that's what he was when he gave these speeches, had confined himself to such messages of uplift, he might have remained a popular speaker and little more. But as he traveled what he called the mashed potato circuit in the 1950s and 1960s, the genial American patriot increasingly sensed that all was not well with his land of destiny. It appeared that not one but two serpents were threatening the very survival of the American Eden, an enemy abroad and an enemy within. In response, Reagan made a fateful decision. In his ever more frequent public appearances, he undertook not simply to celebrate American exceptionalism, but to clarify its meaning and defend it against its foes. The external challenge that he honed in on was the more obvious one, the armed doctrine of communism and its evil empire headquartered in Moscow. In his 1957 address at Eureka College, Reagan defined the ongoing Cold War as a simple struggle between those who believe in the sanctity of individual freedom and those who believe in the supremacy of the state. The unprecedented threat from world communism seemed only to deepen Reagan's perception of America's special role in human history. Time and again, he reminded his compatriots of their peculiar destiny, that God intended America to be free, to be the golden hope of all mankind. And he warned 
Great nations which fail to meet their responsibilities are consigned to the dustbin of history. But nations can also fall from within. And as the 1950s yielded to the turbulent 1960s, it was the domestic menace to American exceptionalism that preoccupied Reagan even more. By the late 1950s, the Hollywood star turned political evangelist had completed a protracted ideological transition from New Deal liberalism of his youth to what would soon be known as Goldwater conservatism. The effect of this shift was soon manifest in his elucidation of his vision of America. Our land of liberty, he asserted, was under assault at home from those who, wittingly or unwittingly, were steering us toward a bureaucratized, all-powerful state in which the government would be our big brother and the individual citizen would be absolutely powerless. In speech after speech, Reagan railed against the growing complexity, profligacy, and unaccountability of centralized government. No government in history has ever voluntarily reduced its size, he thundered. No nation had ever survived a tax burden of one-third of its national income. In 1961, over 50 years ago, he warned, we now have a permanent structure of government beyond the reach of Congress and actually capable of dictating policy. This power, under whatever name you choose, is the very essence of totalitarianism. And in a line that he first uttered in the late 1950s and often thereafter, he declared, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. As Reagan's attacks on the uncontrolled state grew in intensity, he introduced a new element into his conception of American exceptionalism. His country was unique, he now contended, not only because of its felicitous geographical location, and not only because of its ethnic diversity and commitment to liberty, but because of the political system it had instituted in 1776 to secure this liberty. In this land, he proclaimed, occurred the only true revolution in man's history. All other revolutions simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. Here, he said, for the first time, the Founding Fathers evolved a government based on the idea that you and I have the God-given right and ability within ourselves to determine our own destiny. Think of that, he told his fellow Americans in 1964. This idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and most unique idea in all the long history of man's relations to man. By now, Reagan's interpretation of American history had acquired a partisan hue. Mixed with his peons to America's exceptional heritage were fiery blasts at contemporary liberal Democrats for allegedly subverting it and for being irresolute in freedom's defense against its Marxist adversaries. Although Reagan, a former liberal, now accepted the epithet conservative he sometimes wondered aloud whether these labels had, in his words, got pasted on the wrong people. I'm quoting him now. <clears throat> the classic liberal used to be the man who believed the individual was and should be forever the master of his destiny. That is now the conservative position. The liberal used to believe in freedom under law. He now takes the ancient feudal position that power is everything. He believes in a stronger and stronger central government, in the philosophy that control is better than freedom. The conservative now quotes Thomas Paine, a long-time refuge of the liberals, who wrote, Paine wrote, 
Government is a necessary evil. Let us have as little of it as possible. What Reagan's musings revealed was how much his evolving political philosophy had been shaped by the libertarian or classical liberal wing of the rising conservative movement in books like Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, which he read. The leftward thrust of President Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program in the mid-1960s goaded Reagan into developing still another feature of his brand of American exceptionalism. In the harsh presidential campaign of 1964 between Johnson and Barry Goldwater, Reagan declared, this is the issue of this election. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. In the aftermath of Goldwater's defeat, an unabashedly populistic distrust of what he called self-anointed elites increasingly crept into Reagan's discourse. Part of Reagan's genius as a preacher historian lay in his ability to, to articulate his populistic libertarianism in language that resonated with Americans' understanding of their past. Whether one agreed with his anti-statist policies or not, no one could deny that a robust love of liberty and a distrust of overweening authority had been an integral part of the American heritage since the nation's founding. Reagan also made brilliant use of his sense of humor. By the deft use of wit and amusing anecdotes, he could simultaneously soften his tone and sharpen his message. Consider just two examples. He said, government is like a baby. It's an alimentary canal with an appetite at one end and no sense of responsibility at the other. Another example, he said, if you want to make sure crime doesn't pay, let the government run it. Okay. He had oodles of these sorts of one-liners. In 1966, Reagan became governor of California, and in 1969, as governor, he added another metaphor to his expanding symbology of American exceptionalism. In a speech in Washington, he quoted, evidently for the first time, the immortal sermon of John Winthrop about the city upon a hill. Reagan, as we know, fell in love with this phrase and quoted it henceforward on occasions great and small. It became, as it were, his signature line in his ballad of America's story. For him, this single image seemed to capture the essence of what he termed the nation's destiny, to be as a shining city on a hill for all mankind to see. The governor's exposition of American exceptionalism reached a rhetorical climax in 1974 in his address at the first annual conservative political action conference held in Washington, D.C. We will be as a city upon a hill, he entitled it. In its passages can be found virtually all of the religio-political themes that had been developing in his mind over more than 20 years. You can call it mysticism if you want to, he told the audience, but I have always believed that there was some divine plan that placed this great continent between two oceans to be sought out by those who were possessed of an abiding love of freedom and a special kind of courage. Other nations' constitutions, he said, specified the rights that their governments granted to their people. Our constitution, by contrast, spoke of the rights that our people are born with and possess by the grace of God, rights that no government on earth can take from us. In no other society in history, he noted, has the preeminence of the individual been so firmly established 
and given such a priority. As Reagan now focused his ambition on winning the White House, an interesting change occurred in his teaching and preaching style. And a final ingredient in his, uh, of his American exceptionalism came into view. In his speeches on public affairs during the 1950s and 60s, he had frequently sounded a note of dire foreboding. Freedom is fragile, he would assert, and very few nations that lose their liberty ever get it back. But in the late 1970s, even as stagflation raged at home and storm clouds darkened overseas, Reagan turned increasingly hopeful about his country's prospects and deliberately linked his op optimism to his interpretation of the American character. He said, if there is one thing we Americans are sure of, it is that history need not be relived, that nothing is impossible. Brushing aside the counsels of pessimistic fatalism, the populistic libertarian conservative asserted that it was not the American people who were at fault, it was their current leaders. The people, he said, still had greatness in them. He began quoting a line from Thomas Paine's revolutionary war pamphlet, Common Sense. Quote, we have it in our power to begin the world over again, unquote. To which Reagan crisply added, we still have that power. We have it in the, our power to begin the world over again. Embedded in Reagan's mature theory of American exceptionalism was the confident belief that in this land at least, renewal was still possible. By 1980, the year he won the presidency, the conceptual and rhetorical underpinnings of Reagan's vision of America were in place. It was a vision at once theological and political. At its heart was a single word, freedom. The right in Reagan's formulation of each individual to control his own destiny and work out his own happiness without subjection to the whims of the state. The linchpin of his grand design, the bridge between a glorious past and a benignant future, was Reagan's second favorite word, destiny. By permitting its citizens freely to fulfill their individual destinies, America could thereby fulfill its preordained national destiny to serve under God as a shining beacon and keeper of the flame of liberty until men and women everywhere were free. It is not necessary to dwell at length on the various articulations of American exceptionalism that Reagan delivered as president. <clears throat> what is notable is how frequently he raised the subject. A search of his public papers during his eight presidential years discloses that he invoked the image of the city upon a hill no fewer than 40 times during his White House years. He cited or quoted Thomas Paine 17 times, the Founding Fathers 211 times, and the American Dream 160 times. If there was one lesson that the sermonizer-in-chief intended to impart from his bully pulpit, it was the message of America's uniqueness and mission that had elevated him to national prominence. Well-delivered speech was his forte, yes, he was called the great communicator. He was indeed, or rather his was indeed, uh, as others have said, a rhetorical presidency. But always he deployed his rhetoric for a reason. Year in and year out, he championed his vision of America against all detractors and lived to see its enemies in retreat. More than 20 years have now passed since Ronald Reagan ended his political career. His words continue to move and captivate multitudes, as attested by the soaring number of visits to his speeches on YouTube. But 
how fares the overarching belief system that his words communicated, the political and social philosophy embodied in his definition of American exceptionalism. When viewed from the long perspective of American history, what first stands out about Reagan's vision is how unexceptional it was, most of it, by the standards of the 18th and 19th century that I described at the beginning of my lecture. His belief in his country's providential origins and destiny, his celebration of America's founding as a philosophical revolution, a revolution in ideas, his conviction that, in his words, America is freedom. In all these respects, he propounded a worldview deeply rooted in his nation's traditional self-understanding. Reagan may never have read Melville's White Jacket, but we may reasonably surmise that if he had, he would have applauded and happily quoted the line I mentioned earlier, that Americans bear the arc of the liberties of the world. In 2012, American exceptionalism, as Reagan understood it, still appears to resonate with much of the American public. About a year and a half ago, a Gallup poll asked Americans whether the United States, because of its history and its constitution, has a unique character that makes it the greatest country in the world. Eighty percent of the respondents agreed, and 86 percent associated Reagan with this belief. If anything, the anti-statist core of Reagan's vision seems more powerful than ever, thanks to the great awakening of what is known as the Tea Party movement. In his farewell address in 1989, Reagan ringingly proclaimed, ours is the first revolution in, in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government. And with three little words, we the people. We the people tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are the driver. The government is the car. And we decide where it should go and by what route and how fast. The Tea Party activists of today could not have said it better. Indeed, from the perspective of the past two decades, it is increasingly apparent that one of Reagan's most important achievements was to revitalize and perpetuate a populistic libertarian aversion to meddlesome and unaccountable government, an aversion long ingrained in the American psyche. So, Reagania still rules, or does it? In 2012, evidence mounts that for all of the great communicators continuing popularity, he is ranked among our greatest presidents now, his shining city upon a hill has become bitterly divided against itself. Debate about the once obscure term American exceptionalism has exploded on the internet, a sure sign that the national temperature is rising. The more the phrase caroms around the blogosphere, the more it seems to expose a partisan divide. <clears throat> In the, a December 2010 Gallup poll that I mentioned earlier, for instance, fully 91% of Republicans agreed with the proposition that America had a unique character which made it the greatest country in the world. Among Democrats, the percentage in agreement was significantly smaller, 73%. Earlier in 2010, a separate Gallup survey had asked Americans to rate the intensity of their patriotism. Overall, 74% of the adults surveyed described themselves as very or extremely patriotic. Yet here, too, the data showed some conspicuous disparities. Conservatives who answered that way as being very or extremely patriotic, 87% uh, of conservatives so responded, but only 60% of people who call themselves liberal. Among people 65 and over, 86% answered the question that way, but among people of your generation, aged 18 to 29, only 53% did. 
It is difficult to resist the conclusion from all this that the American exceptionalist gospel that Ronald Reagan preached so forcefully is no longer as powerful a bonding agent as it was in his lifetime. Three trends <clears throat> pardon me, in the post-Reagan era help us to understand why. The first, which Reagan himself identified in his farewell address, is a rising tide of amnesia about America's past and animating principles. It seems no accident that according to the polls, Americans under 30 adhere less strongly as a group to the tenets of American exceptionalism than do any other segments of the population. According to a report from the Bradley Foundation in 2008, America is facing an identity crisis brought on in part by the failure of the country's education system to impart an adequate knowledge of our history and founding ideals to the next generation. As a result, the Bradley study concluded, America's memory appears to be slipping away. A second challenge to Reagan's vision is the attenuation in recent decades of religious consciousness and observance among a growing number of Americans. In 2010, a Gallup poll reported that the percentage of Americans who say religion is not very important to them in their daily lives had risen to 19%, a significant uptick since Reagan's time in office. The percentage of Americans having no formal religious identity at all had nearly doubled during the same period. This expanding population group is not necessarily hostile to religious faith, but seems likely by its very apathy to be indifferent to the providential interpretation of American history that Reagan affirmed. The spreading secularization of portions of the American electorate may in time limit the appeal of the faith-based Reaganite creed. The third challenge to Reagan's American exceptionalism may be the most formidable of all. The accelerating phenomenon known as globalization, an extraordinary worldwide commingling of economies, peoples, and cultures and the concomitant rise of a post-national, even anti-national sensibility among many cosmopolitan elites. In some quarters, experts have begun to ask whether the traditional nation-state will eventually wither away. If so, will American exceptionalism die with it? Closely linked to these denationalizing tendencies, especially in academia, is the now entrenched ideology of multiculturalism, with its relativistic celebration, not of America's ideals or its singularity, but of its diversity. Given the enormity of these challenges, it would be foolish to speculate on the fate of Reagan's city upon a hill years or decades from now. But as each generation of Americans takes up what Walt Whitman in a poem called The Burden and the Lesson, we might derive some useful guidance from Reagan himself. I never thought of myself as a great man, he told a friend in 1993, just a man committed to great ideas. Among the greatest of these for him was American exceptionalism. But Reagan was more than just a believer in America's uniqueness. He became, for his generation, America's bard. And beyond that, freedom's bard. For it was freedom that made America worth saving. I've always believed that individuals should take priority over the state, he wrote. With that conviction, he went out and rallied his city upon a hill. And if he could do it, one might ask, why can't we? After all, he told us, we are Americans. <laughs>
Thank you. We learned earlier in the conference kind of about the dangers of democracy. Um, you know, you stressed that Reagan was about, uh, you know, we the people, you know, control the government. We tell the government what to do. Uh, what happens when those people want big government services, want welfare, want, you know, some more socialist institutions? I mean, did Reagan have that much faith in, you know, the American people where they, you know, he just thought that, you know, human nature of, you know, wanting. Well, he was certainly aware of the, of the danger of the rise of what we might call a, a dependency class or of people uh, looking to government for their secular salvation. I think he had an underlying faith that he could make the case and that Americans had not lost their, their deeply ingrained historical uh, experience of liberty. And so he, he never really uh, became gloomy and thought that the, uh, the, it, the situation was irredeemable. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if he were here, he would say that, uh, that people can make mistakes. Uh, and he probably would even admit in a way that he himself had made a mistake early on. He is a devotee of Franklin Roosevelt, voted for him for president four times. Uh, and so Reagan changed his views uh, over time, and I think he believed that others could do the same and indeed many people did they were the so-called reagan democrats who voted for him as when he was elected president twice by landslides so he he did i i would say as a historian have an underlying confidence that the people properly instructed would would respond in in ways that were beneficial to the body politic and he worried incidentally in his in his closing address i didn't quote the passage but in his farewell address to the nation january 1989 just before he left office he did worry and it was it was a little bit more somber a mood than he usually uh showed he worried that we were losing our memory our sense of our our past and what animated us as a people and so he, he urged that new generations learn those vital lessons from the past. So I suppose you could infer from that that if people did not learn those lessons, they could go adrift and go astray and, and make policy decisions that would lead to a, uh, a decline of liberty and a decline of American greatness. But overall, looking at the, at the totality of his career, I, I think he was fundamentally optimistic. Again, not to say that the people could were, were perfect in the sense of infallible, but that the bulk of the American people were better able to take the country forward by their own choices rather than have a self-anointed elite top-down manage them and control them. He was, from an early period in his life, very distrustful of that kind of approach to government. Um, since you have studied leaders, political leaders and intellectuals, um, you might have some idea about what made Ronald Reagan an exceptional leader. Uh, would you want to talk about his, his traits, uh, intellectual, personal, what made him so effective? That's a good question, and it's not easy to answer uh, in, a, in a sound bite, but uh, I, I will, I will take an, uh, make an attempt at it. He, he was a, obviously a remarkable figure, recognized early on a, as a leader. Uh, he was uh, a sports broadcaster, radio broadcaster in Iowa after he got out of college in the depths of the Great Depression. And um, early on, he decided to go to Hollywood, and he was only about uh, 25 years old when he just got in his car and drove to California. And uh, um, he uh, had uh, he successfully auditioned to get a, a contract with Warner Brothers and became a, a rising star quite quickly. So he had a, a, a self-confidence and, and a faith in his own abilities and a willingness to follow his dream, if you will. That's a, certainly a notable trait. Uh, he had, I think, a very naturally ingrained, genial, respectful personality. 
so that he could, he could argue with people and make his case, but he would not make enemies. There are many tales of Reagan in Hollywood arguing by the hour when he was a liberal, arguing with his conservative friends, and they would never con convince each other, but it was like a game. And yet everybody liked him, and the man became head of the Actors Union for about five years, Screen Actors Guild. He seemed to have that ability even then of, um, of showing leadership traits, and, and, and particularly through his ability as a public speaker. Uh, also, his inexhaustible fund of humor. Uh, I did a paper on uh, how Reagan moved from left to right uh, recently for a conference. And one of the things that I discovered was that in the 1950s, when he was making this ideological transition, he was one of the most popular people in Hollywood for being the, um, the master of ceremonies at events. He, he participated in something like a thousand such functions over about a 10-year period. It was like he was out every night of the week, practically. Uh, and so he, he was obviously recognized uh, as a person of, of quality, someone you wanted to follow, someone who would look out for you. I think something that should be stressed in the case of Reagan uh, is his religious faith, which was uh, really something that was, uh, he owed much to his mother for. Uh, his father um, was a person with an alcohol problem, and the family had strains and stresses. But Reagan's religious faith, I think, and this, this sense of of that God had a plan for him as well as for the nation was a trait that I think imbued in him a certain serenity all the way through, all the way through. And it's interesting, you know, you probably know he was nearly assassinated just about a couple months into his presidency, March of 1981, very close call. And there is evidence uh, from various sources that after that he felt that his life had been spared for a reason. And he had, a, 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 again, a and he had a kind of an affinity with the Pope, uh, John, uh, John Paul, who was also nearly assassinated about uh, roughly at the same time. So Reagan had, had a sense that he, in a sense, he was a man of destiny, but not in the sense of man of destiny getting up on a horse and riding in and establishing a dictatorship or you know, conquering a country, something like that. No, it was, it was a sense, a deep sense in him that if he prayed and, and kept his faith, kept his feet on the ground and so on, that he would would be blessed as he already had been blessed. So I think a key ingredient in Reagan's character is that uh, religious faith. And a friend of mine, Paul Kengor of Grove City College, K-E-N-G-O-R, has written an excellent book on just this topic. It's called God and Ronald Reagan. It's very easily uh, read and uh, I think uh, highly informative and, and really persuasive. So, so those are some of the traits. I would again emphasize his sense of humor, I think I alluded to it a couple times, that really was very disarming and it made it possible for him to operate in all sorts of tense and confrontational situations. And he had opponents and adversaries, but very few people really hated him or had, you know, had a kind of personal aversion to him. And that, I think, is, is something that we increasingly, since Reagan, want to have in our leaders. Someone who doesn't come across as having too much self-importance, someone who can laugh at himself. Reagan's jokes, I told a couple of those, if you think about them, he wasn't making them really nasty. It was sort of general, general jokes about government like a baby and so forth. He could make a point, but it wasn't like he was shaking his finger at somebody. And I think that that was key, especially because Reagan was a man of strong conservative conviction, and some of the things that I quoted were pretty controversial points of view in his time. But it's interesting, if you compare him, say, with Goldwater, Barry Goldwater, who ran for president before Reagan, Goldwater was a man, I think, of real integrity and, and conviction and, and many admirable th qualities, but he had a a manner of speaking that at least in the 64 campaign shook a lot of people up. It kind of scared people. Uh, he famously said extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, but he didn't say it with a smile or whatever, you know, and so people kind of, a lot of people got a little worried, but Reagan I think probably learned from what happened to Goldwater, and Reagan learned how to, as a, as a very effective actor, and I'm not saying that in criticism, I think that, that his acting career helped him really to, to relate to people and to be a leader in the best sense of the word. So those are few, a few of the traits, religious faith, his humor, uh, his basically, I think, decent man next door personality. And, and I could give you other examples, that's probably enough in answer to this question.
George, as a follow-up to, to Dale's question, today when you, you mentioned that there's a lack of cooperation between the Democrats and the Republicans in Washington and, quite frankly, yeah. across the country at the state and the local levels, is it because we have a dearth of leadership in both political parties mm -hmm. or perhaps is it that there is a much greater divide uh, between what the, the far right of the Republican Party mm -hmm. believes and the far left of the Democratic Party it just seems that uh, you know, the same criticisms were made when Ronald Reagan yeah. came into office. He's too far to the right. Yeah. People won't cooperate with him. And yet history tells us that Tip O'Neill and, and Ronald Reagan were not only great friends, uh, but, but they also accomplished many things and yeah. both moved uh, toward each other's positions when need be, yeah. and yet in many cases held firmly to their beliefs. So I is, it, uh, is it a lack of leadership? Is it a dramatic ideological shift? to both extremes, or is it something else? My, my own view is that this has been building for a long time, and there, there are several contributing factors. Reagan and Tip O'Neill um, were at the tail end of a long period during the Cold War when uh, there was a kind of feeling in Washington, in the Senate especially, that people at the end of the day got along and, and made adjustments and so on, so that you, you weren't enemies outside your day job, so to speak. I mean, people clashed, they had strongly felt uh, convictions and so on. But several things have happened. One, I think government has grown and become more and more involved in more and more of our daily lives. It's been involved uh, not only in such traditional fields as defense and to a certain extent uh, welfare, highway transportation and so on, but now we have government you know, speech codes in, in, in states. Uh, we have issues of, of, of profound moral uh, importance uh, such as uh, abortion, for example. And so where, it's, where people's feelings uh, are, are very deeply aroused. It isn't just a matter of shall we spend a little more money on this program or that program. We're now at the point where I think the very the, we, the society is so politicized in the sense that politics or policy affects us everywhere so it's harder to have maybe spheres of privacy or spheres outside of politics. Another thing that I think has happened is that increasingly as people go to college and to graduate school and so on. Uh, studies, I understand, have shown that the more education you get, the more ideological you get in your outlook on the world, the more consistently liberal, conservative, left, whatever, you become. And so it then becomes perhaps a little harder to, to find compromise and adjustment when it seems like you're arguing about things that you, you can't give up on very easily. Another trend that I think is happening, and maybe these all kind of work on one another, uh, there's a man named Bill Bishop, a sociologist, kind of a, maybe a quasi-sociologist, wrote a book about four years ago called The Big Sort, S-O-R-T, about how Americans are increasingly segregating ourselves politically, religiously, and so on. He said, if you go look at a map of the United States, there are more and more counties in the country which are either overwhelmingly one side or overwhelmingly the other. And so by our, we're migrating, the red state, blue state, so we, we're, we're tending to segregate ourselves out so that some of the kinds of older interpersonal accommodation are becoming less common. Uh, and, and finally, I think that we have to say something about the, the omnipresence of the instant media in explaining all this. If someone makes a charge now, I mean, there are plenty of wild statements that were made in the era of the Founding Fathers about one about another, Hamilton and Jefferson and so on. It was pretty, pretty nasty at times, and sometimes people say, it's not so bad today. Just go back and look at the Civil War as if that were a great analogy, or, or Andrew Jackson's time, or the, the uh, first decade of the, of the new, uh, under the new Constitution. There are many other periods in our history where temperatures have been high, you know, tempers have, have flared and so on. But what I think is different in our time is that we can't get away from that easily. We just turn on CNBC, Fox News, whatever, go to the internet, the latest, and you'll find the latest outrage of the day. Oh, did you see that so-and-so called so-and-so such, such something? It seems to me that we're not able to buffer 
that kind of political debate. And, and it, for, for, for maybe other reasons than I can think of, it seems that the debate is not only nastier, but it's louder. And so we have lost some of that, that ability to be civil in our disagreements. And um, I don't, I, I don't, I, but I think Reagan was able, because he was a polarizing figure, no doubt about it. There were a lot of nasty things said against him as president. But he had what was called a Teflon presidency. That was somebody's uh, term for it. It didn't stick. You could call him a name, it didn't stick. And that's partly, I think, the, the geniality factor, and I'm not trying to trivialize that, but the geniality factor, the humor, uh, this sense that the man didn't take himself too seriously, uh, and that he had the kind of serenity that I traced to his religious faith, all of that made him somewhat above the fray. And I don't know why we don't have more leaders like that today, but I think that the environment in which we live um, with, the, with this sort of mass communication frenzy makes it harder for people to um, to uh, calm down at times. And I know I, I, if you turn in the talk show radio, and I'm, I listen to some talk show radio, so it's often, did you just hear what so-and-so on the other side said yesterday afternoon? And so it's uh, back and forth. And I, I think that that keeps us more on edge as a people. And um, so those, that's not laid out in a, in a nice numerical order, but I think those are some of the factors that make it harder for us to have leaders. Uh, I, so I don't blame it so much on leaders as such in Washington, but it seems to me that the, the political environment for many reasons over a generation or more has been moving in this increasingly polarized direction. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, obviously you're a man of history and you know a lot about Ronald Reagan, um, but do you see anyone in the near future uh, kind of being like him with his personality or his leadership style? Um, I, I don't. It, it, sometimes uh, people are, are, are searching for Ronald Reagan the way that people, American liberals, used to search for another John Kennedy, another kind of charismatic person, wit, and so forth. Um, it sort of stood out from the crowd in his particular generation of politicians. So I, I don't suppose that we can simply I, I go and find one and, oh yeah, there, there's a Ronald Reagan over in that state, let's uh, build him up. No. But I think what's happening, uh, conservatives in particular uh, have been looking for someone to carry on his legacy. And the legacy, as I've indicated, is partly intellectual, his sense of, his special sense of what America was all about, but his legacy in, in, uh, in policy and also his legacy as a person. And I don't see... Uh, I think there's been a kind of groping for such a figure, especially on the American right. Um, and um, it's not uh, easy to find. You just don't sort of instantaneously produce one. One thing that should be pointed out about Reagan, by the way, is that he ran for office. He entered politics relatively late. He was already in his 50s when he ran for governor of California first time. He had been a movie actor from 1937 to early 1960s and so on in his youth and middle age. And, uh, but he was also actually learning a lot about politics in that, in that period, uh, and I, I won't go into the details on that. But Reagan, in a sense, was training for public office long before he ran for public office. And uh, I think that's, that was helpful to him because he had skills leading Hollywood actors uh, during times of great labor strife in Hollywood, fighting to keep the communists from taking over Hollywood. Um, he, he spoke to some, he shook hands with something like a quarter of a million people between 1954 and 1962 while he was working for General Electric Corporation as a company goodwill ambassador and doing the GE theater television show. And Reagan gave something like 9,000 talks in that eight-year period, sometimes as many as 19 a day while he was working on the road, going all around the country for GE. And he did it. He was afraid of flying. And so he had it in his contract that he didn't have to fly anywhere. So he had to take trains. 
that was useful to him because in between all these stops he was reading the Freeman magazine, Human Events, National Review, all sorts of literature. He was undergoing what he called a postgraduate course in political science because he was speaking for the company and he was increasingly becoming conservative and uh, he had I think a remarkable political education before he ran for politics. So one thing that I t like to look for, as I look around for a leader, I want to find out what are their life experiences before they ran for office. Um, did, they, were, did they have experience in the private sector? Uh, did they run a business? Did they have some success outside of the stylized ways of running for office in this country? Reagan did. And Reagan was, uh, as conservatives like to say, a conviction politician. He was a conservative by conviction, not convenience. And that came through. And I suspect that one thing that happened in our recent primary system, at least on the Republican side, was that people were looking for someone who they wanted to find with conviction, who really had proven that he would, would believe and not simply utter the appropriate phrases and so forth. Now, there are different ways to define what is appropriate experience. And I'm not trying to choose among you know, candidates running for office. But it seems to me that those are some of the things we might want to look for in looking for another Reagan-like figure, maybe not a clone of Reagan, but someone who really had studied something about American history and didn't just have somebody you know, hand him a speech to give. And that's another thing I should say, if I may just add a little bit more to this answer. Reagan wrote his own speeches in those early years. All those 9,000 talks, well, those were pretty much you know, uh, extemporaneous or you know, memorized. But Reagan, until he was president, basically wrote his own speeches, and he did his own study. He didn't have a team of people just kind of feeding him things. Very impressive. Even as president, he had a whole speech writing staff, but he was a very good editor. And he would go back and rewrite and fix things so that it came out the way he wanted to say it. So he, I think, was in control. Now, this is very different. We know this now about Reagan from various research that's been done. But while he was president, that was one of the criticisms of him that, oh, well, Reagan, is just, he's just standing there and, and mouthing his lines. You know, he's just an actor. He could memorize his lines. Well, Reagan was a good actor. He had a photographic memory. He could memorize his lines. But it turns out that the lines that he was giving politically were his own. So again, that suggests a, a greater depth to the man than he was given credit for during much of his uh, late political career. So that's another thing that, that I, for one, would, would urge us to look for in a leader, uh, someone who really shows that he has lived a certain life with experience that are, experiences that are meaningful and revealing, and that he has, or she, the convictions uh, that are thought out and not simply sound bites. Thank you very much, Dr. Nash. Thanks.